Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, once again. Uh, welcome, thanks for joining in. Um, right, I hope everybody online are doing well. Good to see you. Uh, very good morning. Uh, okay, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for your mercy that is that are new every morning. Uh, Lord, even as we're looking to studying about you and your word from your word, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, you will come and breathe your breath over us. Uh, help You are the spirit of wisdom. Uh, Lord, help give us the wisdom to understand your word, your teaching. So I pray, Father, we submit and surrender our hearts and our minds to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so we've only had uh, two hours of class this month. That is, I think, Jan 18th. No, sorry. The week before that, uh, last week, what we were in at CLC, uh, Christian Leaders Conference. And so, um, OK, let's do a quick recap of what we covered in the first two classes, uh, and then we'll move on, OK? <clears throat> Um, so a couple of key points that we looked at, okay, uh, if you're writing your notes or you know, separately, uh, it will be helpful for you to write you know, as key point and then make these notes. Um, so two key points we looked at when we started off. First one is this miracles, healing, and deliverance is not in the process, but it is in the person. Thank you. Okay. So he miracles, healing, and deliverance, is it is not in the process. Okay. That means a method, in other words. So it could be uh, laying down on the hands, etc., uh, etc. Et okay. I'm also having a little bit of allergies. So please uh, forgive me if I'm sneezing. Uh, so uh, one of the first key point is that uh, miracles, healings, and deliverance is in the person and not in the process. Okay. The second key point we looked at was that everybody can do this. Every believer can do this. Right. So that was the second key point we looked at. Uh, then we went on to look at eight different biblical reasons as to why we must minister in supernatural healing and deliverance. Eight different biblical reasons. Uh, can anyone name the few? What's the first one? Miracles. OK. Uh, I'm sure there's more than miracles. Get through. So <laughs> we looked at eight biblical deliverance. Miracles reveal God's greatness. Yeah, but thank you. Right. So miracles, healing, and deliverance reveal the reality and nature of God, right? That's the first one. Miracles, healing, and deliverance reveal the reality and the nature of God. Miracles reveal God's Greatness, miracles demonstrate God's compassion. Number four, miracles have a powerful effect on people, especially on those who do not believe. And the fifth is the importance Jesus gave to miracles. Uh, number six, the kingdom comes with power. The gospel is to be preached with accompanying signs. Miracles encourage people to believe for more of the supernatural. So those were the eight uh, biblical reasons as to why we must miracle, uh, minister in healing and deliverance. And then we went on to look at why are we not demonstrating, why are we, as in why is the church, the global church, uh, not demonstrating enough or more of God's power? Uh, what was the first one? Right. The first one was lack of knowledge. Second one. Okay. The first one is uh, why are we not uh, demonstrating more of God's power? First one is the lack of knowledge. 
right? Uh, and the second one is? Wrong teaching. Thank you. Wrong teaching concerning the supernatural. Um, I, I'm, I'm just reviewing, okay, kind of summarizing what we did in the first two classes, and all of this is in your notes. Uh, okay, hold on. Leaving the miracle ministry reserved for an elite few, replacing the supernatural with modern substitutes, uh, unwilling to press in till we see more of God, power displayed, uh, other roadblocks to the supernatural, not stepping out in faith, depending on methods instead of his presence, discouragement of past failure, and improper motives. Um, so if you don't recall any of this, <laughs> Uh, please revise all these points when you can. Uh, all of this is in your notes, as mentioned. Okay, so this is where we kind of stopped at in the last class. Is uh, the last point was improper motives, um, but let's continue from where we left off. Uh, another important question that we need to address. Uh, uh, okay, uh, everybody online uh, doing okay? Uh, you able to follow? Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, great. I'm having allergies on high definition camera. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, all right. The, one of these questions that commonly uh, is asked is don't demonic powers also demonstrate supernatural? Okay. What is the question? Don't demonic powers? Also, demonstrate supernatural. Uh, what do you think? Yes? Devil <laughs> also performs supernatural, is it? OK. So what is your response to it? So in your notes, it says, goes on to say, a common contention against us believers, emphasizing healings, deliverance, signs, and wonders, is the point that even demonic powers through false teachers, practitioners of witchcraft also perform supernatural signs. Um, there's a scripture in your notes, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. The coming of the lawless ones is according to the working of Satan, with all our signs and lying wonders. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. Okay. I'm not giving you the page numbers of where I am because uh, I have a very old edition of this book and uh, um, so I was told that the page numbers are different from your textbook as well. So please follow along, okay? And uh, So 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one. Who is he talking about? Who is the lawless one? The one without any loss, the devil, right? Um, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Okay. Now, remember in the last class, we spoke about there are two kingdoms at war one is the kingdom of God, and the other is the kingdom of the devil. Okay. So, just as we as believers can tap into the supernatural power of the kingdom of God, uh, people can also tap into the supernatural of the kingdom of the devil. That's why witchcraft and all of this exists, okay? It is a reality, but it is a lying wonder, as the scripture says, okay? The powers and signs are there. So, uh, you know, there are so many examples from the Bible we can look at. Uh, the immediate one that comes to our mind is um, magicians in Egypt, isn't it? So God asks Moses to throw the staff down, uh, but magicians could duplicate that or replicate that right um, and then they went they could do two more of uh, you know they could turn the water into blood uh, and all of that could happen but that was it that is all they could do now if you remember God did not panic right God did not panic is like oh you know these people are also doing miracles signs and wonders uh, no um, God's power was far superior than the, the, the power of the magicians in Egypt. 
right? It is limited. That is all they could replicate or duplicate, uh, you know, back in Egypt. Uh, but then we go on to see that there was so much more that God did in Egypt that nobody else could stop God from doing that. So, yes, while the fact is that there is the power of darkness that can duplicate all of these things, that should not stop you, okay? That should not stop us from continuing to minister in healing and deliverance. Are you with me? Yes? Um, see, one of the famous... Uh, examples of uh, counterfeit is uh, is through fake currency right um, so how do you how, does anybody have a currency 10 rupees 100 rupees anything I'll give it back to you anybody okay oh, Google pay everybody's on Google pay nowadays <laughs> oh you do okay Right, so you all know the example that I'm about to give, right? So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here I have uh, the Indian currency of 200 rupees. Um, okay, so uh, how do we know uh, so the people who identify, who are trained to identify the difference between a fake currency and a genuine currency, uh, how, do they, how do you think they study? What do they do? How do they become uh, a master in identifying fake currencies? What do they do? Sorry? They know about the currency. Right. So, I mean, I say, so I am the master uh, or this prof my profession is to identify fake currencies, right? Counterfeit notes. Um, am I going to sit and study <clears throat> all the fake currencies in the world? There could be hundreds of, diff you know, 200 rupees notes. That's not the genuine one. Will I have the time to sit and go through all of them? No. So what the people who identify the counterfeit notes is they don't study the fake. They, they study the genuine one really well. You understood? Right? They don't study all the fake currency notes, you know, like hundreds and thousands of it. They don't, you know, they can go... It's just a lot. But what they do is they study the genuine one really well, from the thickness of its papers to everything, uh, what is written on it, the print, uh, a lot of details that goes into the genuine note. They study this really well. And that's all they need to do. They don't need to sit and identify or study all the counterfeit notes. Are you with me? Right. And so the counterfeit will... Uh, counterfeit will exist, uh, but it shouldn't stop us from learning from the genuine, the authentic. Are you with me? Okay, so um, the, the, you can go through the no your notes where it talks about Moses and the magicians in Egypt, uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, or Baal, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Another question we'd like to uh, address is, is asking for signs wrong? Is asking for signs wrong? In the PDF, I'm in page 25. OK, let's read a few scriptures, shall we? So Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 42. It says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Okay, please pay attention to the scriptures as I'm reading it, okay? Uh, then some of the scribes and Pharisees, scribes were people who uh, were the wise people, okay? They were in charge of writing the scriptures down, okay? Uh, 
sometimes even translating scriptures. So they were very uh, smart or very wise people. So some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of the Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Okay, uh, one more scripture. Uh, let's read Matthew 16, 1 to 4. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you do not discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Okay, so I can go through scriptures after scriptures uh, from the notes where it talks about signs and uh, people asking for signs. And uh, Jesus did not really give them a sign. Now, let's come back to that original question uh, for us also. Uh, is asking for a sign wrong? Why, did not, why didn't Jesus uh, respond to them saying, yes, I will show you a sign? Testing? Yeah, okay. So the people who came to uh, ask him for asking for signs and wonders, no, okay, there's something that you need to learn, okay? There's a difference, a very thin line between asking questions and questioning. Okay? I'll say that again. There's a very thin line in the difference between asking questions and questioning okay what is the difference it comes down to the motive of your heart okay asking question is you're genuinely asking me a question you put your raise your hands up so i don't i did not understand this could you explain one more time questioning is how do you know that's true you see the point okay how uh, how do you know this is true who are you who, who gave you this thing who are you to tell me etc what are you doing? You're questioning, right? I'm not saying questioning is always wrong. I mean, we got... <laughs> but that's why I'm saying there's a very thin line, right? And it all comes down to the motive and the intention of your heart. Now, Jesus could see the people's intention when they asked for a sign. They were challenging him or questioning his authority. Right, and that's why Jesus uh, did not. Uh, Jesus kind of rebukes them in the scriptures that he tells. So, uh, asking for a sign is at the core of it is not really uh, wrong unless your intention and your your motive is in the right place. Okay. 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 Oh boy, uh, I am so sorry, guys. My uh, allergies are pretty bad than it is usual. Um, hence the constant sniffing. Okay, um, let's go to the section called the Ministry of Apologetics in your book. Ministry of Apologetics. It's in page 30 of your PDF. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, okay, so the Ministry of Apologetics, right? Uh, so, what does the word apologetics mean? Defending your faith. Right to defend and or to reason. Okay, to defend your faith. If anyone says, okay, hey, uh, Bible is corrupted, um, Bible is not credible, or Bible is not authentic, uh, you know, you are able to give a reason and defend is like no you know this is why i believe bible is not corrupted this is why i believe bible is is authentic and credible okay so apologetics it simply means to defend your faith okay if someone quest come on, comes and questions you saying uh, why are you a christian uh, i don't believe in you know in religion i don't believe in god uh, are you able to defend your faith that's what apologetics basically is okay and i think you have uh that subject apologetics second year second year okay. second year all right so uh look at and one of the famous scripture that is used for explaining uh apologetics is from first peter chapter 3 verse 15. first peter chapter 3 verse 15 any person who uh gives a uh who says apologetics is important will begin by using this scripture it says peter saying here but sanctify the lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense so, okay so that word used there is apologia right uh, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear okay now uh, again, just coming back to that word apologetics here. Um, the way the world looks looks at apologists is oh, they are, they are very highly intellectual, isn't it? Uh, you, you heard of the name like Nabil Qureshi? Nabil Qureshi, okay. Um, Frank Turek. So all of these are men who have a ministry in apologetics. That means their ministry is to defend the faith or give arguments about why I believe in Jesus. Why is the Bible authentic and credible? Right? Uh, why Christianity is is a true uh, religion, faith, etc. Uh, so there is this perception that okay, every apologist is very high, highly intellectual, like super smart people because they have to study a lot, right? Uh, but when Peter, it's you have to remember who is making this statement over here. It is who? Peter, isn't it? He's saying, always be ready to give a defense. Now, let's look at another scripture uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Okay, it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Okay, let's pause there for a minute. So when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, what did they see? They saw the boldness. It doesn't say that they saw the intellectual brains of Peter and John, you know. Uh, they marveled. No, it says the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled. Who were they? They were fishermen. Isn't it? They were fishermen. Peter was a fisherman. Uh, in John chapter 21, when, uh, you know, by when Jesus is dead and gone and uh, the disciples don't know that Jesus has risen, Peter is so discouraged and disappointed, he's almost at the brink of depression. So he says, I'm going fishing. It's there in John chapter 21. He says, I'm going fishing. Uh, because Why? When we go into disappointment, we go back to the very thing which is familiar to us. Okay. Now, Peter going fishing is fine. I don't know why the tax collector and all say, I'm also coming with you for fishing. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the point is, Peter, John, these were uneducated and untrained men, according to the society then, right? And they realize, just continuing to read here, and they realized that they had been with Jesus and seeing the man who had been healed 
standing with them, they could they could say nothing against it. Okay. So the point here we're trying to make is it is very important that you are able to give a defense for your faith. Okay, but apologetics must be supported with demonstration of the power of God as well. It just only cannot be reasoning. Okay, guys, this is very, very important. Okay, apologetics without demonstration of the power of God will only be a time of debate and argument. Can I say that one more time? Apologetics without demonstration of the power of God will only be a one hour of time of debate. Okay, so you know, you have one hour, you come and person A will come and present why they believe in God, person B will come and say why they don't believe in God. They will have a wonderful, you know, time of debate. Person A who is a Christian will give wonderful points, but at the end of the one hour, person B will still be an atheist or a person from another faith would not have really been impacted. But so that's why it's very important that you do the ministry of apologetics, you learn everything about it, yet it has to be supported with the ministry and, and the demonstration of the power of God. Are you are you with me? Yes, because Paul, Apostle Paul, he demonstrated, he reasoned and demonstrated. Apostle Paul, he defended the faith, but he also demonstrated the power of God. Okay, so let's look at the scripture. So Acts chapter 22, verse 1, it goes on to say, um, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, apologia, before you now. Um, and then Acts 26, 24. Acts 26. 24 it says now as he thus made his defense festus said with a loud voice paul you are beside yourself much learning is driving you mad uh, so it, those are verses just to show that paul was a very learned man okay apostle paul was a very learned man um the christian scholars of this day and age uh, say that Apostle Paul had an equivalent of 20 PhDs during his day and age. Some of you are, oh, yeah, that's no big deal, 20 PhDs, you know. <laughs> Some of the Christian scholars claim that the intellectual standard of Paul was equivalent to 20 PhDs of our day. Try getting one PhD. I dare you. <laughs> Uh, and so, but it is the person like Paul, you know, who's right, who others are testifying that, hey, you've learned too much and it's driving you mad. But it is the same person that who uh, so well learned also demonstrated, uh, you know, in the power, in, in moving in the power of God. That Acts chapter 13 and Romans 15, you can read all of those um, for your references. <laughs> okay. Are you all with me? Any questions so far? No questions? Uh, anybody online? Uh, are you all doing okay? Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> So please go through the notes of uh, every uh, of the section that where Paul uh, demonstrated and defended his faith uh, in your notes. I'm not going through it because there's quite a lot of it. Okay. Uh, once again, I want to remind us that we are, you know, using this publication as a point of reference uh, to go through. So the idea is not to go through page by page by page of it. Uh, that is for you to do it. Okay. We're just going to look at very important points uh, and then, just, uh, you know go through the notes. Um, okay, so let's look at, uh, let's move into chapter 2 and look at God's word on healing. God's word on healing. Chapter 2, that's where we're going to start off.
Okay, we're going to look at the section that talks about the source of sickness, disease, and ailments. Okay, the source of sickness, disease, and ailments. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the beginning, uh, book of Genesis. Uh, when God created the world, He created the world in an absolute perfection. Right, everything about what He created was perfect. Right, say perfect. Perfect. Everybody say perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. Right. So everything what he created was perfect, unless man disobeyed. Right. And so, and that gave way to sin. Are you with me? So what what did sin do? It gave the license for the kingdom of darkness to come and rule and reign in our in our dimension in our realm. Okay. Uh, because of man's disobedience, uh, the decay came in. So let's look at some more scriptures. So the first point there talks about man's disobedience, a natural process of decay and corruption set in since the fall. Okay, decay and corruption uh, sets in since the fall. So because of the fall, all of creation was subject to a process of decay and corruption. That first statement is very important because of the fall. What is the fall? Man's disobedience. Okay. Uh, due to this process of corruption and decay, we have many other conditions such as birth deformities and defects and so on. Our human body normally undergoes a process of wearing away. These are not God's design or God's original intent, but as a result of the sin, decay and corruption that prevails over all, over all of creation. A time will come when creation itself will be delivered from the corruption it is being subjected to at, to at present, there will be new heavens and new earth. Okay, so that whole passage is simply saying that it is because of the fall that we are all become subject to decay and 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 sin and corruption. Okay, let's look at Romans chapter eight, verse nineteen and twenty-three. Nineteen to twenty-three, it says, "For the earnest expectation of the creation." eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Okay, let's slow down and read verse 21 again. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So what does that mean? It means even creation has been subjected to corruption since the fall. Are you with me? So it is not just you and me. Because of one man's disobedience, the decay and corruption set into all of creation. Now that was That is literally the, the strength or the power of sin. That it gave license for death, wages of sin is what? Death. Wages of sin is death. Okay, so, and that kind of set in, into all creation. Verse 22, it says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs to, uh, together until now. Not only that we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body okay everything strayed away from god's original design okay uh, i want to ask you this question uh, how do how would you define sin define sin Doing anything against the will of God, okay. All right, Sanjay says separation from God, okay. Disobedience, okay. What else? No, sir, I don't know anything about sin. I don't sin. I am perfect. Yeah. What do you say for sin in Hindi? Up. Okay.
See, which is out of our weakness in our flesh, okay? Right, so there's something that you need to understand is there's a difference between a state of sin and acts of sin, okay? Now, the day that, the minute that I submit and I, re, I gave my life to Jesus, okay? At that moment, I have eternal life, okay? When I say, Lord, I'm a sinner, I repent of my sins, come into my life, I give you my heart, come and be the king of my heart. So what, what happens? I'm praying the sinner's prayer, right? At that minute, I am saved from the state of sin. Okay, so from then on, I'm no longer a sinner because Jesus is my righteousness. Okay, however, because I'm still living in this physical body, I still have the commit uh, capacity to commit the acts of sin. That means I can still murder. <laughs> right, I can still take a knife and kill you. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay, so there's a difference between a state of sin and committing the acts of sin. So what we're talking about is how the whole of creation went into the state of sin. Because of one man's disobedience, all of creation went into the state of corruption and decay. Okay, the whole it, this whole fall kind of begins very, uh, very dark over there. And so, and that's literally where we gave the devil the license. It's like, yes, please come in. Please come in and destroy our household. You know, all of this is yours. <laughs> okay, you have complete license. That's what sin did. Basically, we strayed away from God's original design. Okay, uh, when we go against God's design, that's basically sin. And there is a lot of definition for sin, and all of your answers are right. Okay, um, and so there is no one particular answer that is right for sin. <laughs> And so because of that, we see that Satan is getting involved uh, in, in, the, in the second point of chapter 2. It says, Satan's activity and direct involvement of demonic spirits. So Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, All who are oppressed by the devil. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so that's very important there. It's very clear that all of this oppression and uh, and, and and possessions and, and sickness and, uh, and pain was caused by the devil. So we need to get one thing very clear, one thing very straight, is God is not the source of sickness. Okay? Uh, another very important key point of you know for 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 you to get this deeply rooted in your know, in you is that God is not the source of sickness or oppression. Okay, it, Scripture is very clear about that. Jesus went about doing what he did and setting people free, all who were oppressed by the devil. Okay, so there's a question here from Sanjay that says, just a thought, we all blame Adam and Eve, but would we have done any better in their place? Would we have done any better in their place? Uh, I, I don't know about everybody else, Sanjay, but I don't think I would have done any better in their place. Uh, it's very easy, isn't it, for us? It's like, you know, when I get to heaven, I think I'm going to have a word with Adam. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, yeah. So I'm just going to continue reading the notes, the section that says, while we know that all sickness are due to demonic spirits, okay? While we know that not all sickness are due to demonic spirits, typically the following would be recognized as due to demonic work. Incurable diseases, birth defect, deformities, unexplainable diseases, uh, symptoms that get worse after prayer and ministry, symptoms that seem to move around to different regions of the body during the prayer and ministry. Um, uh, 
Right, Shani, you uh, you have a question. I see you raise your hand. Yeah, I just don't understand that. It says, well, we know that all six are due to demonic spirits. The following are due to demonic work. I don't understand that. Okay, yeah, thank you. So let's go through that uh, point one more time. Okay, so from, we'll go from the previous section where Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says that all who are oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. So Jesus went around ministering, setting people uh, captives free, uh, you know, all who are oppressed by the devil. Okay, and then goes on to say that while we know that all not all sickness are due to demonic spirits, not all sickness are due to demonic spirits means uh, that question is kind of answered in the next point, which is the natural causes. Okay, in point number three. Um, so, for example, um, a simple example would be that let's say I am eating constantly without any work out or exercise uh, i you know i, I just con i'm constantly consuming sweets and whatnot and then eventually that leads to obesity and uh, or diabetes um, <laughs> it's very easy for me to blame the devil it's okay this is because of the devil uh, and not take responsibility and say no it is because of me i did not eat healthy I did not take care of myself. Uh, so you, that is the point that I was trying to make there, Shani, is that uh, while the sickness, the source of sickness and oppression is from the devil, there is a certain responsibility on us as well. Because we are living in this physical body, uh, we need, to, and, and it's corrupted, and, and, it, and it is you know, positioned to decay, right? That's why we age, and that's why things get old, you know, we get old and all that. Uh, it is very important for us to take care of our bodies and not, you know, that's one of the examples and I'm hoping I'm getting there and just give another illustration. Uh, let's say that uh, I just got healed from uh, an, an ankle ligament tear or whatnot and you prayed for me and I am healed. Right? So my ankle is absolutely fine now. My ligament is strong or whatnot, right? But I'm not going to be foolish enough to go and jump off a big, tall, high wall and hurt myself again and then blame the devil again for that. Right? It was, I climbed the wall and it was, I chose to jump off the wall and hurt myself again. And so, um, and that's what that statement actually means, um, Shani. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, yes. Yeah, okay. Right, so uh, thanks for that question because that's what's leading to the next point, and we'll probably stop with that. Is uh, re-emphasizing that point is a personal physical problem. Physical problems could be because of other natural causes such as neglect, lack of proper care of the body or mind, improper diet, use of substance such as alcohol, drugs, smoking, or due to accidents. Okay. Um, all of this can happen, right? Um, when you don't take care of your body properly, your lack of proper diet, improper diet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, or users of uh, alcohol, drugs, and all of that has a direct impact on your body, isn't it? Uh, but the good news is that the Lord Jesus Christ came to be the complete remedy for the fall, for sin. He came to redeem us from demonic oppression, and He, by His mercy and power, reverses even the effects of natural causes. And Lord Jesus came to be our savior, healer, deliverer, and redeemer. Amen. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, I'll kind of stop here. And uh, I'm actually thinking I'll, I'll, I'll take the next hour uh, off and we'll continue the following week because uh, I'm constantly sniffing. Sorry about that, guys. I hope that's okay if you have the next hour break and uh yeah apologies i know we've missed a couple of classes already but uh yeah i don't want to keep sniffing and sneezing here okay well thank you all so much for joining um i want to encourage you all once again to go back home uh, and uh, go through these notes and revise them again um, just so your foundations get stronger all right thank you all for joining i'll see you all next week